Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Marty Schenkman, and this is a little different of a webinar than I've normally done. Um, I'm not just joined today by Tom Rogerson, but uh, this is going to be the Tom Rogerson Show. And um, it's a great topic, and my hope and goal is that I'm bringing to you um, interesting topics because so much of what we do as estate planners is so eclectic and covers so many different areas, not just of the law, but of, of human nature, that um, I think it's just a great asset to be able to, to learn what Tom's going to share with us today. Um, before we get started, um, let me have a quick word from our sponsors, uh, Vanessa. Uh, thanks so much, Marty. This is Vanessa Kanega. I'm the President and Director of Content Development with Interactive Legal, and thanks so much, everyone, for uh, for joining us today on this webinar. Um, this is the kind of uh, fresh and forward-thinking topic that we've come to expect from uh, Marty's webinars and that we uh, hope to support and promote uh, through Interactive Legal. If any of you are not familiar with Interactive Legal and you'd like to learn more, I'd encourage you to go to our website or contact us uh, using the contact information on your screen right now. Thanks very much. Thanks, Vanessa. I don't believe anyone from Peak was able to join us. Our other sponsor that helps us promote uh, the webinars is Peak Trust Company. Um, their contact date is there. And should anyone have need for uh, administrative trust services, uh, I certainly can recommend them. Um, before Tom starts, and I'm going to basically turn it over to him, um, I'm going to tell Tom the question I'm going to ask him at the end of the program. He'll probably answer it during the program, but I thought as a wrap-up, um, promoting family meetings is, is a great thing to do. And I'm going to make sure that at the end, just as a wrap-up and summary, Tom, that you clarify for everybody, including me, how I can bring you in and use your services and get your help when I orchestrate a family meeting, and whether or not at that same meeting I should have all the other advisors. So that, that we'll ask at the end, but I just thought that would be a nice way to uh, uh, start. So Tom, it's, it's all yours, and just let me know when to advance the slides if I'm not on cue. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much, Marty. I really appreciate this opportunity, and thank you for so many of you uh, uh, calling in. I, I agree, this is an unusual topic, but it's really becoming a hot topic in the estate planning area. If I, 10 years ago, if I said to an estate planning council that I wanted to come in and talk about family governance, um, they would say, poo-poo the idea usually and think, well, that's you know unimportant or the soft stuff, that's the soft side. Um, but it's really becoming a higher and higher priority. And so what now what I'm seeing is a lot of estate planning councils are looking for this topic and trying to learn more. How do we help the client and as I term it, not just prepare the money for the family, but prepare the family for the money. We've all seen way too many disasters along the way. What I hope to build the case for today in this webinar is your role, you as advisor, your role in the process. I actually think you as an advisor can do things that the family can't do for themselves in the getting started process. It's very hard to change culture from the inside out, and it often needs somebody that understands this. So what can you do? And when I mentioned that family meetings are a necessity, unfortunately, right away, people misunderstand what I mean. Because when I say family meeting, they right away think of a family meeting from their perspective. The parent thinks, great, we're gonna get the kids together and we're gonna tell them uh, you know, what, the, uh, what they should expect. And, and, uh, and we're gonna do it in, a, in some way that it's gonna be positive. And the attorneys are thinking you know, the same thing. We're gonna roll out the estate plan, put up a big flow chart, and we're gonna to tell them about the trusts and educate them on what trustees are and all that. Um, actually, family meetings have almost nothing to do with those things in the beginning. Ideally, we get to that point over time, but in the beginning, it really is about the family. And so I wanna build the case of what it can look like, why it can look that way, and, and as I said before, what your role in is this, in this process. As an example of, uh, of, uh, of kind of my slow evolution of this, I used to be at Cooper's and Libran up in Boston and built for them a, a financial planning practice up in Boston and was marketing it to wealth firms and eventually got hired away. But, but in doing it at Cooper's, I remember I was helping to not implement like you at estate planning attorneys implement the estate plan, but at least educate people and get them motivated and give them a, a plan, uh, some kind of a financial and estate plan to get started at thinking about the issues. And uh, so oftentimes I would get called by the parents and say, hey, would you come in 
and come to a family meeting and show the family. You explained it to me. Would you come and she explain it to them? And I'll, I'll never forget, I, I did one family meeting where I explained the estate plan, the trusts and the structures and the tax benefits and all that to the family. And then the father said, okay, guys, you know, what do you think? I mean, I did this for you. I love you. I want the best for you. Um, you know, what do you think? And the kids were saying, oh, no, dad, you know, we love you too. You're great. You did a great job. It's your money. Do whatever you want with it. You're going to live a long time. And, and I thought, wow, what a, what a healthy family. And during one of the breaks, I asked one of the sons, I said, is that how you really feel? And he said, absolutely not. And I said, well, then why'd you say it? He said, the two things I don't want to sound like in front of my father are greedy or stupid. And if I say, what's it, you know, when do I get it? I sound greedy. But if I say, what's the trust? I sound stupid. I mean, he said, I almost felt like it was a trap. Um, and what he, what you recognize there though, is they didn't have a really honest communication process as a family. And they were then trying to unearth all kinds of advanced information when they didn't have the basics of who each other was and what their motivations were. Um, so I started to, from that experience, started trying to change the family meeting process a little bit and add more about how, who are you guys? How, what are your values? What do you care about? What do you vision the future to look like? And, uh, and this will give you an idea of what that journey looks like as we get into this. So the agenda for the meeting today is, as Marty has on the screen here, um, what's our client experience in the survey results? And I'll share with that briefly. What's the cost of conflict avoidance? And it's really expensive for families to avoid conflict, and yet they do it every day. The problem with traditional planning, um, family culture, what can we do about it? A process that hopefully you can, you know, I've created a process with my wife, we call it the six step process, but I think you're going to find it really helpful for you to think through what you might want to think about doing with clients, or at least encourage them to go forward in some motion, some process. So um, number six, the cost of doing, uh, doing and not doing this work to, within families. Um, now I'm going to briefly describe, there is a body of work we've tried to put together on a website called famleg.com. But it's just a body of work to describe some of this information uh, that you may be um, interested in, and then key conclusions. So on the next slide, you see, though, that uh, from our own family client experience, uh, we've had a chance now to work with over 250 families at running family meetings. Plus, we've done a survey of over an additional 100 families. And the, the number one thing that comes through time and time again, families that su succeed are having organized and prioritized family meetings. Families that are failing are not. I mean, if there's one thing I could say that will help a family succeed, it is having family meetings. Uh, remember, though, this is not about the money necessarily. That's a business meeting. This is a family meeting. And what does that look like? Uh, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I was had the opportunity to speak with the Green family of the Hobby Lobby family recently, and I was talking to one of the sons, Mart is his name. And he said, yeah, we actually have a family meeting every month. And you're expected to be there and people fly in coach i'm not talking private jet or anything but they show up and they celebrate the family and they learn a lot about the family they have a special place for it. it's really cool actually and the next day i was talking to david green and he said yeah we've only had three family meetings in the history of our company and i said wait a minute <laughs> yesterday mart said you had them every month and he said oh yeah mart's talking about the meetings where we talk about the family we build up the family i'm talking about the times we talked about the money in the business they only did that three times and, and it, the, the reason for the difference, though, is I think the reason that the three meetings that focused on the money went as well as they did for that family were because of those monthly meetings. Now, you don't have to have monthly meetings, but boy, not at least having them once a year. That's tragic. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and you'll see then we're going to uh, you'll I'll go through some of this additional research about why families are failing and what they're doing about it. But most of the families that we've worked with are using now a family meeting process as kind of the foundation of what they're doing going forward. And you're gonna see most are using some for, form of the six step process that I'll talk about in a minute as well. So on the next slide, you can see that uh, family meetings to succeed, you have to be having family meetings to prioritize and organize. Hiring a facilitator, this is where you all come in. Having somebody else come in and help the family start to learn about these things is very different than mom or dad learning about it and then trying home and to come home and lecture the family about it. Uh, I often tell the parents that, look, if I give you the message, you may then have the right message. I just think you're the wrong messenger in the beginning. 
Um, and so one family member, one entrepreneur said it this way. He said, no, he said, I love the idea of you running a family meeting or somebody else running one because I came to realize long ago in my business, the opposite of control is participation. And if I come in trying to drive an outcome, I am clearly looking, looked at as the, you know, the dictator here. But if I can somehow participate, that kind of requires somebody else run the meeting. Well, then is that a role for you and for me going forward? Um, places turn out to be very important. Uh, having a nice place. If you think of memories, you think of the place you had them as well. Uh, building teams, trust building, team building. You do it with your management team. Why wouldn't you do it with your family? And then endow, if the process works, why wouldn't you endow it? And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So in the next slide, what you see, this is a, a David York um, slide, but uh, David York, uh, actually, excuse me, this is not yet David York. I'm going to cover his in a minute, but uh, this one is about the notion of conflict. Families typically today, wealthier, successful families, are often in a conflict avoidance modality on the left-hand side of the slide. Wealth doesn't cause them to be in this situation. It allows it. It allows them to focus on being independent, almost to the point of not knowing each other that well. And so the conflict avoidance is great right up until there's an explosion. And then they jump over to the right-hand side of the page and either, either they have you know, an explosion, they need expensive mediation, or they have a fast split. And what they bypassed in the middle was the notion of practicing and managing conflict. How do we help a family get into that middle space? And that next slide just shows an example of a highlighted one of how do we help a family get into that middle space? And you're gonna see there are a lot of really cool tools that are related to getting to know the family better, them getting to know each other better, and them getting to know you better, and you getting to know them better uh, going forward. The next slide gives an indication of this as well. Um, this one might look confusing. A lot of my slides look confusing. I apologize. But uh, this Jim Grubman, Dr. Jim, Jim Grubman helped me uh, come up with this background graphic for this. And every all the research I was working on fit within the graphic. Uh, if you don't know Jim Grubman, by the way, he wrote Strangers in Paradise. It is a seminal work, I think, in this area of family governance. I highly recommend it to you. Um, but the idea here is just imagine level of wealth going up as you go out to the right and level of dependence on the left-hand scale, with the, but reversed, kind of the uh, upper area is dependent people, then independent, and then down low, interdependent. And the idea in the lower left-hand corner, low net worth families have tremendous interdependence. They're making decisions by necessity together. They're learning about each other. They may not like it, but they know a tremendous about, about each other because they're having to. They're negotiating, they're rubbing against each other every day. Um, you know, in frictions of conversation, uh, dinner table conversations are consequential. When uh, when one somebody wants to know if they can borrow the car, it it's it's consequential because it's one car. Um, and and so when they're sharing a bathroom, they're negotiating who gets it first. It's very consequential. But if somebody in that family has ability and and creates wealth, they want to get away from all that pain in the neck, and they want to focus on raising their children in independence. And they would lovingly and intentionally spend money to raise their children in a much more independent environment where they have their own car at 16, where they have, whether they bought it themselves or not, they have their own bathroom, they have their own bedroom and maybe an in-suite that bathroom. Um, they go to private school, not always, but often. And this creates wonderful independence and yet it creates estrangement to a large degree. They don't know each other as well because they don't have anywhere near the level of friction points. And yet these are the very same people we're expecting later in life when mom and dad are gone to somehow magically figure out how to get together and work together because now they've got to run a business together or settle an estate or run a foundation. Well, how do we help them keep some of the interdependence that the parents had beforehand? And that's really where we're going to be going in this um, is that notion of how do we reintroduce the family to itself repeatedly going forward? The next slide shows, uh, interestingly, entrepreneurs often are the ones that want that independence and they create that, inter in that independent family, that red dot in the middle. And oftentimes parent entrepreneurs raise their children, expect, wanting them to be independent, kind of like they were, and go off and do their own thing and be as successful and maybe even more successful than I've been. Um, interestingly, multi-generationally successful families have a familyness culture and an entrepreneurial mindset. 
And, and usually entrepreneurs are not able to create that. That's an oxymoron, but it turns out to be true. Um, an entrepreneurial family, I'll give you some examples of them. If you ever read the book about the Mellon family, Thomas Mellon, the original creator of the Mellon uh, Financial Mellon Bank, was he built a family that was entrepreneurial. And if you read the stories of how Andrew Mellon was raised in that family with his brother and how they worked together in the bank and how it was very entrepreneurial, um, you got a sense of that it was an entrepreneurial family. But Andrew Mellon raised his children to be totally independent. And I'm not speaking out of school. Read the books. I, I'm, I'm not speaking about family stories that they told me. I'm say, read the books about the Mellons. Uh, they've written about this themselves. Andrew Mellon raised children to be so independent, they really didn't know each other anywhere near as well. And they self-professed that. Um, and it caused a family separation over time. And yet they were the family that was supposed to then inherit these businesses and be able to run them. Um, all kinds of things uh, didn't work out as effectively. So how does an entrepreneur then create a familyness culture and an entrepreneurial mindset, which is the thing at the bottom. Um, the next slide kind of gives an indication of what we normally see or what, what would be ideal to see. And this is the David York slide I accidentally almost referred to earlier. Um, David York has this wonderful vision where he talks about on the left-hand side of that little uh, kind of circle that the family purpose should drive the planning process and the planning process should support the family purpose. And if that's done, then the assets and the businesses really are in the middle of being managed and run by this process that's surrounding them. We almost never see this, at least I've almost never seen this. It's a wonderful you know, uh, vision of what possibly could happen in the future. What we normally see, or what I've almost always seen is the next slide, which is, and you can go ahead and advance, that the money and the assets drive the planning process and the planning process supports the money and the assets and the family purpose is over there in left field that hasn't really been focused on. And that's why I mean that the family meeting should be focusing on what is our purpose? Uh, what, is, what are our values? What does the family stand for? What is our history? What are our traditions? And you'll see I've got a pretty organized way of describing some of that later of what you might want to help families step into. But getting them to understand purpose first will help you as an advisor create a better plan for them. You can create a plan, like David York said, that is driven by the family purpose, and the plan can support the family purpose. Um, I just, as I say, that's not normally what we see. Normally what we see is the next slide, which is traditional estate plans do one of three things, or some combination they're in. They divide the assets equally amongst the children. I call it divide and conquer. Um, funding independence to the point of estrangement and repetition of mistakes, repetition of, of, you know, lack of learning from each other is profound. And you don't have to have a family business to uh, want the family to work together. Even if they just have liquid assets, it's really helpful if they understand that they can learn from each other. The second thing we often see in traditional estate planning, if it wasn't divide and conquer, it's trying to force independence. And we see structures that are designed to do that, like a family vacation house is left to them to figure it out or a family foundation, you're all on the board, you know, you know, get together and figure it out. Or a family enterprise has left equal shares to everybody. And, you know, again, figure it out um, with no preparation. Again, if you, they're encouraging family to be independent during their lifetime, and then they're trying to force interdependence out of the estate plan. And we see a tremendous amount of lawsuits coming up um, out of these things where division ends up happening. The third choice is the purely discretionary trustee or trust often creating entitlement and, uh, and not avoiding it. Uh, it. This is oftentimes what I'm seeing in the purely discretionary trust with a trustee is a formula for resentment and failed self-esteem. Uh, children often feeling things like they must not have trusted me. All right, well then wait a minute. If that's the traditional planning, what the heck do we do? And how do you start a family meeting process? The next slide shows a, this is actually from last week I had a prospect send me the agenda that they put together. I changed it so that you can't tell who it is and, and all. And, um, um, so there's no names in or anything in here. But this was the proposed agenda from the father on what we're gonna talk about at our first family meeting. Notice there's nothing about the family on here. It's about the, the trust, the, the family office services, the, the investment advisors giving reports on investments, the tax accounting, uh, summary and conclusions of you know, dynasty trust. It was all about the money and the structures. Uh, I'm not saying this isn't a great place for a family to get to. 
I'm just saying it is absolutely not the place for family to start. And, and this is counterculture because a lot of times advisors are saying, yeah, you got to talk to your kids about it. The implication the parents feel is I've got to go home and tell my kids what the estate plan actually says. Okay, I, I want them to get there. I just don't think that that's the place to start most of the time. The next slide shows some resources you might find really helpful in this regard. I think David Brooks' book, uh, he's a New York Times columnist uh, that wrote books on, on uh, values and on a number of other things. On, but his new book, The Second Mountain, he focuses on this problem that we have in American society of hyper-individualism. And we've got to, the pendulum's got to start swinging back where people start, you know, hyper-individualism causes fragility in human uh, in human beings they less able to handle stress and anxiety and, and issues and and you're seeing these uh, these um, epidemics of depression and loneliness and all kinds of things come out of this hyper individualism so his solution is join community join a community and he lists a whole bunch of communities the one that he doesn't highlight is family well the first community you were born into is your family and so it's interesting, um, David Brooks is going to be speaking at the Tiger 21 National Conference in uh, Arizona this year, this coming February. I'm speaking after him on how do you apply what he just said to your family? Because he's focusing on how do we as a culture build a different United States culture so that people are more interconnected and uh, more resilient and able to understand and work with each other. I'm trying to do the exact same thing, but at, this, at the family level. The next book, The Price of Privilege by Madeline Levine. Uh, go, go back, yeah, it's a great book. Um, the, only, the only pushback I'd have on Madeline's book, you can come away from it, she doesn't specifically say this, but you can come away from this book feeling that the only solution in every case is therapy um, because she's a therapist. Uh, but she does focus on this notion of the disconnectedness today of the American family, especially in a families of theoretically privilege. The pressure imposed, even if the parents don't intend it, and how unhappy these kids are often growing up, and what that's causing in her practice. The third book there is um, by Sonia Lubomirsky. Um, anyway, um, that's my best guess. Um, I, I love the book, and I think I highly recommend it. She focused on this notion of hedonic adaptation. How do you, you know, as if you improve the lifestyle of a family, it becomes normal to everybody in the family very quickly. Well, how do we slow down the process of an increased lifestyle appearing normal? How do we give people a perspective of reality? And as you've seen in many of your clients' situations as well, um, big difference. By the way, so far from what I'm talking about, you might be thinking, well, this is only for the uber wealthy, wealthiest people we've ever worked with. In reality, um, I think any family can benefit from everything I'm talking about because really underlying all this is the notion of building a better, stronger, communicating family. I don't care whether you have money or not. That's something that families really aspire to. So I love what I do because my wife and I benefited from this because we're, we're applying some of the things I'm going to talk to you about, but we're applying them with almost no money or very little money and it's benefiting us significantly. So those are three great resources I recommend to you to and look at those particular things. Um, the next slide focuses on the underlying problem that we've all heard of, which of course is the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve phenomenon. That um, in my own family is where that red dot is. My great grandfather was very wealthy. Um, he was the president of a very big trust company, wealth management company, largest in Boston by any measure, by the way. Big shareholder. He was a very wealthy man. Started a foundation that has a little bit more than a billion dollars in it now. Um, and what's really interesting to me is. He was not the wealthiest ancestor by a long shot in our family. If you go back a few more generations in my father's side, uh, one of his ancestors was a guy named Ezra Weston, also known in America as King Caesar. He and his son, Ezra Weston II, also known as King Caesar II, um, were the largest shipbuilders in the world in their day, largest ship owners, owned 110 merchant ships, and right here in my hometown, and uh, w one of the wealthiest families in America. Uh, that money was gone generations ago, and it was gone for all the reasons that I'm learning about as I uh, help families with this. Uh, it, they really did use the wealth to allow the family to separate and to become independent, and that was wonderful, except that there was no sense of, wait a minute, what, who are we? And the we was gone. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like. The next slide just uh, shows a quote I got from one of the Rothschilds. This is in Nathan Rothschild's book, but it's in regard to this notion of 
wealth and privilege. And in regard to wealth and their family, he said, it requires a great deal of boldness and a great deal of caution to make a great fortune. And when you've got it, it requires 10 times as much wit to keep it. Now, it's really interesting to me that um, you know, he had said that I had a chance to, at one of the conferences I was doing to, um, to speak on this. And afterwards, a guy came up to me and said, wow, what you do is really important in our family. We have a family meeting every year. We focus on this all the time. Um, you know, and, 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 and it's really incredibly successful. As an example, he said, I'm starting a business with a couple of my fourth cousins. And as he said that, I thought to myself, what is the fourth cousin? <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I couldn't even think of what one was, let alone did I know one. And here he's starting a business with them. Turns out he's one of the Rothschilds as well. And he said, we learned because we have these meetings. We know each other better. And we used to think it was normal. But we've come to realize our family's really unusual in how well most of us know so many more family members. Um, well, you don't have to be a Rothschild to at least have that as an aspiration and try and do a few things differently to, uh, to combat the natural trend in society against this. So, and when I say the definition of fail, the next slide has a brief little dis description of it. Yes, it's the money's gone, but much more importantly, the intangible assets are gone as well and slowly forgotten. Who we were, who we are, literally, and, and you know, our history diminished. I often hold up my cell phone when I'm doing presentations and say, you know, how many of you in this room have all of your first cousins from both sides of your family in your contact list on your cell phone? And if you called them right now, they would recognize you by voice. Usually it's a very small percentage of the people that raise your hand. I mean, less than 1% usually. And that's just first cousins I'm talking about. You go to second cousins, there's almost nobody that has all that on their cell phone. No, and we, we, we keep claiming that family is so important. Hallmark says it every day on a, on a card, and yet we don't evidence it by what we're doing as families. Um, the third thing that gets lost is the knowledge of each other. Uh, to know and to be known is a very foundational issue. Resilient people feel known. Resilient people feel like they know others. Um, it is a very powerful thing to just be known. And why wouldn't a family at least work on that? Leonard Sweet had a quote for this. I changed a little bit, so I call it a Leonard Sweet-ish quote. But what you did is your history. I'd say big deal. What you set in motion in your family is your family legacy. I pulled out a quote from the uh, article about the family that just died in South Dakota from, their, from Idaho. Um, these two brothers had built a wonderful business. But the article, and you should read, just Google it and read some of the articles. The legacy that they built in their community in um, in Idaho and, and in the in the country um, and in their family was really significant and that's what oftentimes people are looking for in legacy is what they're doing in their family and yet they just don't have a method to do it so they, they go to their estate planner and try and draft a legacy I'm I'm sorry you just can't draft a legacy there's much more to it than that so the uh, the next slide shows the causes of this problem and the biggest study in this area was done by Williams and Pressure. And Williams and Pressure did a study of 3,500 families now um, that had focused in the, uh, you know, that, that where they focused on succession and what happened and all that in the family. And most of these families in their study had failed at preserving their wealth and their sense of family. But the, I was really intrigued by they went one step further and they asked the families that failed, well, how'd you fail? What happened? And what they found was, according to the families that failed, 60% of the failure was due to lack of communication and trust within the family around group decision making. Now, when I mention that, right away, clients and advisors get their eye off the ball. They see one word in that first sentence, and that's the word they take away, the word communication. And they think, well, we communicate fine. You should have been at our Thanksgiving table. We were having a great yuck around. I mean, we were just, we communicate great. They misunderstand that, 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 yes, they have the same quantity, perhaps, of communication that a, another family might have, but the quality of the communication may have changed dramatically. Remember I said before, the low net worth family, dinner table conversations were consequential by necessity. As wealth increases, dinner table conversations may have as many words, but they're often more inconsequential, more social. How's your golf game, Dad? How's your tennis game, Mom? And they may not be learning about as each other and how they make decisions, where they're coming from, what their aspirations are. Don't get me wrong, they, they learn some, but not as much as they could. So that's really the opportunity. That's where the bulk of the, of the problem is, according to families that said they failed. If that's the case, why aren't we helping families there? 
most advisors gloss over that one and go to the second one. The 25% of the failures due to unprepared errors. So we try and prepare them with lessons and learning. And the next one was a no sense of clarity of purpose within the family and, and sense of place, culture. Um, you know, that one I think relates to the first one as well. But the, the smallest reason for failure was due to mistakes made in the planning and investing area. So the opportunity for us as advisors, if they're coming to us to help them preserve their wealth, both tangible and intangible, the challenge and opportunity for us is to be willing to help them not just on the tangible, but the intangible. And to me, the door is wide open. Um, the op and, and if you want to grow your business, I had this in the, in the kind of promo for the, the talk. If you want to grow your business, this kind of language I'm finding to be incredibly appealing to entrepreneurs and their spouses when at conferences and the like, where they're saying, you're right, my t t plan right now is not dealing with this. It, my plan right now, and I often say it this way, if, if I say to a, a, an entrepreneur, if I rip the front page off your will and shuffle it with 10 other clients of mine um, and then show them to you, you couldn't pick out your will. There's no you in there. Your name was on the cover, but other than that, it's all provisions and, and boilerplate. Um, how do you put you in that document, you in your plan? And there's a huge opportunity for all of us in this regard. So that next slide just shows this notion of, can we start focusing on family culture? Because these are all culture related issues. If we can help a family there, and I think by the way, we can help a family there to get started better than the parents can. Um, outsiders help change culture better than the insiders do. Businesses know this, they bring in outside consultants to help change culture at business. Families are recognizing the need as well. Um, the next slide gets into, okay, well, that's enough of the problem. What's the solution? I, I've over now 25 years had a chance to run 250 you know, family meetings or work with 250 individual families uh, plus. So I've tried a lot of things that failed, <laughs> but, uh, but that's created a few things that worked. And, uh, and so I've tried to compile them into what I think are the things that are most likely to be present in families that are succeeding. And I'm hoping you find uh, some tools here and some direction here that might help you think through if you want to get into this space or be part of a team getting to this space, uh, what could your role be in the process? So the steps are in the next slide. And I kind of go revert, you know, from bottom up because I think the, the first one is the foundation. So you start at the bottom. Where are, where's the family today? The assessment, and so we send out an assessment. There are multiples out there. I'll show you briefly what uh, the one we use looks like in a minute. But um, and it's really interesting just for them to self-diagnose where they are, and they do, and they give you back a report of what they're indicating they need to focus on, and it becomes very clear. So that's typically done before a family meeting. The second, third, and fourth uh, topics there we would normally cover in the first family meeting. Um, the first step is when we get together an education of the family. This could come from any of you. This is something I would typically deliver at a family meeting. But you know them to get an understanding of what are the issues, why are families failing, the kind of material I've shared with you so far. And because it, I want to have a sense of context that they all understand what we're about to talk about and that I hope they all recognize that it's important. So um, that's why the education is important before we jump in and start talking about it. Um, the, the next step is if 60% of the failure is due to lack of trust around group decision making based on our communication, could we learn each other's communication and or leadership style? There are multiple tools out there to learn leadership style or communication style or personality profile, things like that. I'm going to show you the one that we take families through. I think it's the best for families. Um, but, uh, but anyway, you, it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool. I've had so many families say about that tool, even if it doesn't help us go forward, it explains most of the past. Uh, in my own family, I get passionate for the need for this because I, it, this tool that I'm going to show you saved my relationship with one of my sons. Um, we had a communication problem and I was blaming him for it and I was punishing him for it and it wasn't his fault and it blew me away. So I'm going to show you what that tool looks like in a minute. Um, the third step or the next step, excuse me, the fourth step we would take them through is a values exercise. We would do those, those steps there in their first family meeting. So notice we didn't talk about the money. Um, but I think this is foundational stuff to talk about before we talk about the money. If we're going to start talking about the consequential things, and we don't want them to feel like they're either stupid or greedy, as that one son said about, you know, I don't want to sound that way in front of my father or mother. Um, 
having the understanding of the education and understanding the communication and the values ahead of time is really important. It allows us then to start thinking as a family, what actions could we take to change our dynamic going forward? And then if we, if we come up with good ideas, how do we endow the process? And that's the sixth step. The next slide shows, in reality, I think this is a repetitive process. I say that because in the families that we've worked with that are succeeding or that we surveyed that are succeeding, what you find is most of these agenda items for our six step process uh, end up being agenda items at every one of their family meetings. I mean, every time you get together, isn't there some level of education you could do? Of course there is. I mean, Tiger 21 members get together every month to learn more about planning and investing and, and structures and all kinds of things. W, a young president organization, they get together every month. I mean, you know, you all have to legal education credits, you have to, we have, we have to learn every year. So isn't there education a family can, of course there is. Why wouldn't that be an agenda item at every family meeting? And, and again, about the, and then communication, can we learn more about how we're approaching each other and build trust? If trust is important, can't we build trust every meeting? Of course we can. Values, uh, can we learn more about what we care about? Can we fine tune it? Of course. So what you're seeing is these things become repeat, repeated and that's why our mission statement on the next slide for my wife's and my company is uh, our passion and mission is to intentionally introduce and reintroduce a family to itself repeatedly. Sound repetitive? It is, intentionally, because this is, should be a repetitive process with tools, activities, and metrics to measure success. And again, that's what the six-step process is designed to be. The next slide shows you, um, I blanked out because it's got some of my secret sauce on it, but it, but it shows the, um, the assessment we take families through. And it's a series of about 20 statements and one of them I've highlighted here that you can see, and uh, just as an example, on the left-hand side, they have a chance to grade, how important would it be for our family to achieve this statement? And on the right-hand side, they have a chance to grade, and how well are we doing at it? So in this one, for example, um, we have a plan for a genuine transfer of leadership within the family and businesses, if we, if we have any. That's usually a number five on importance, really important, and it's usually a zero <laughs> or a one, maybe, on most, in most families that I work with. Um, and they self-diagnose it, and they're just showing you, here's the road, they're showing each other when we, when we divulge this, the family meeting. And that's really what the next slide is focusing on, is um, what, here's, a, here's what we would normally present to the family meeting. We would then categorize their particular list uh, in order. For this particular family, the number one for them was, I have identified the best role for each of our family members that leverage their unique talents and gifts. I know their strengths and they, they know mine. That was the number one level of priority. And yet there was a large gap, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, between where they, um, where they are and where they were. 22-point gap from where they are and where they wanted to be on that one. So um, they self-diagnosed and they, they were creating their own roadmap. The next slide uh, shows the second step in the six-step process. And that's the education. And just uh, the next slide just briefly shows, you can read it later, I'm not gonna read the whole next slide, but it shows all these different, I mean, there are all kinds of topics that they could have uh, agenda items. And you, there's a reason for every one of the advisors on this call to be at a family meeting ongoing, because there's some level of knowledge you can be imparting about, on that family every day about something that they ought to know about for their future success. So um, Tom, that education, Tom. yeah, sorry, Marty, go ahead. No, no, let me, let me interrupt on purpose um, on slide 37 and just ask you a question. A lot of our clients, and I, I, I'm believing this would apply to many people on the call, are not going to be wealthy enough to create a family office or a family bank, but they can certainly mimic that with whatever wealth advisor trust company structure that we use and do it at a much lower wealth level at a much lower cost. How do you, how do you um, mold what you have on slide 37 for a more moderate wealth claim. I mean, is this all yes, feasible for somebody worth $10 million, $5 million? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, my level of wealth is kind of between those two you just mentioned, Marty, and I'll be honest to say, and we're doing everything that I'm talking about, but you're right, I don't have enough money to do a family office, um, but you're right, if I get my advisors working together effectively, you know, Marty, you and I and Phil uh, Kubeta wrote that article about collaboration. 
if a group of advisors are willing to work together and the client's willing to let them work together, it doesn't take a fortune for the client. It doesn't take a lot of money either. I think it's less expensive ultimately to do this. If the advisors know how to work together, they effectively are creating for the family a family office environment. The family bank idea is as simple as just a small, a certain amount of money that's encouraging the family to be entrepreneurial and or spend money and or time together, uh, you know, learning. Um, it can be very simple. My wife and I have one. We fund it with life insurance. We didn't even put a lot of money in. It just bought a life insurance policy on the two of us. But when we die, it gets funded and it then encourages the family to get together and encourages entrepreneurial activities after we're gone. So, and I'm not Let worth me... the kind of money that... Yeah, no, I think that's critically important, and I just didn't want anybody on the call to think that, you know, for clients worth under $100 million, this doesn't apply. And, and the article that you mentioned, I, I will offer, if anybody wants to email me, uh, Shankman at Shankman Law, my email is uh, maybe at the end of the slide deck, maybe not. Um, I'll send you the article that I did with Tom. And exactly what Tom just said was what I was thinking. This is very scalable. A client worth even 3 to $5 million using technology like a web meeting, the attorney, the accountant, and the independent financial advisor, whoever is serving in those roles, you all can collaborate and provide exactly what Tom is talking about uh, on this slide. So don't, don't tune this out for smaller clients. It can be incredibly valuable and it is scalable. And if you email me, I'll send the article Tom and I, I did on that topic. Back to yeah, you, Tom. Great. And yeah, th thank you. And I mean, I'll, I'll mention some others briefly. Philanthropy, number six on this list. Um, my wife and I, we just allocated $1,000 for each one of our kids to give to charity um, when we started this off. And then one additional $1,000 for them to, to decide on together that they'd agree on. And, um, and now you, you don't even have to use $1,000. It could be $100 each. But so it doesn't, the, most of these things on this list are about building teams with a family, reintroducing a family to itself, getting them to know each other's abilities. And that's really what this is about. So I think that curriculum can go on and on. The next slide shows the communication uh, concept. And if you just keep going, uh, the, the next slide shows George Bernard Shaw had a great quote, which I think really relates to so many of the families that we work with. The single biggest problem with communication, he says, is the illusion that it has taken place. And the parents think they somehow magically articulated uh, so many of these concepts to the kids and they talk to the kids, no way, didn't happen. And there's so many reasons for it. I mean, there are four basic areas where communication can go awry. There's what you want to say. There's what you actually say. There's what they hear you say. And then there's what they think you meant by it. <laughs> and that's where they get devious. Um, no wonder there's so little communication. How do we get to honest communication? I mentioned the Green family earlier um, I, because I, uh, one thing I didn't tell you is I had a chance to talk to one of the grandsons-in-law. This isn't a grandchild. It's a grandchild's spouse. And the grandson-in-law said, yeah, I love these family meetings that, that, that I come to as well every month because we think it's important to build the bridge of trust so we can drive the truck of truth over it. I loved that imagery. <laughs> This idea that we're working to build a better sense of family so that when we have to speak truth, we're able to do it. They're practicing and managing conflict every day in what they're doing. So if you go to the next slide, this is the tool that we actually take families through. It's the Stratton Interpersonal Leadership Style Test, but it's one of those quadrant type tools where um, there are people that are persuaders and there are people that are counselors and analyzers and directors and as you can see, people on the left are challenging how they communicate, like Trump, let's say, and people on the right are supportive in how they communicate, like uh, Nelson Mandela. And people think that the ones on the left are the leaders and the ones on the right are the squishy handholder followers. Wait a minute, Nelson Mandela? I mean, you know, there are people that have changed the world, maybe more long-lastingly changed the world on the right-hand side, more so in many cases than there are on the left-hand side. So um, it's not strength and weakness, it's strength and strength, but they're different. If you look at the, less, the next slide, um, I actually have, this is a family, and I changed all the names and moved them around a little bit, but you can see on this one that on the left-hand side, you have on the challenging side, Bobby and Mary, that's the purple couple. I linked the couples with the arrows. So Bobby and Mary and the, the purple arrow on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have Fred and Betty, the green arrow. Well, if you walk into Bobby and Mary's house, you feel it. You, you experience 
their leadership style. It's loud. It's messy. If you walk into Fred and Betty's house, you feel it. It's organized. It's quiet. It's slowed down pace. Um, and you're going to get these two families to get together. And when mom and dad are gone to figure out what to do with the family business, Fred and Betty are going to feel stepped on. And, and, and Bobby and Mary are you know, not going to not even look back. Um, it doesn't mean that they, that they can't work together. They just have had no experience at working together. So this is a powerful tool. There are many others. But it's empiric. I mean, it's just it, it's it's really real data that they learn a tremendous amount. And what you'll see in tools like this, then we spend most of the time in the meeting helping them understand how to style shift to work with each other more effectively. The next slide shows my wife's quote for this. Oh, excuse me. This was the Green family uh, quote that I mentioned a minute ago. This was a grandson-in-law. We need to build the trust, build a bridge of trust with each other, so we can drive the truck of truth over it. Um, and Jamie Bush, a friend of mine up here in Boston, said, you know, this really all relates to forgiveness. I've had families all show up at the family meeting, and yet when I talk to them, you know, before or after, they say, yeah, we're so excited we're getting together because we know we really want this to work better, and we know that other people need to apologize and change, and then we're going to be so much better off. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's all about, you know, them changing. What about you changing and coming in with an expectation that I'm right and they're wrong? Um, how do you change that? Uh, and Jamie Bush says it this way, unforgiveness is like eating rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. Well, how do we actually start with forgiveness first and have that openness? Um, the next slide shows what I call some of the action steps. Um, this is where we're getting to the next step in the six step process, but um, setting a vision like the Rothschilds have done versus the Vanderbilts, uh, but practicing, going to the next one, practicing here, uh, family philanthropy is really important. Making decisions, I think family philanthropy is making, learning how to make decisions together, but that have lower consequence. Turning that into more of a discipline is where we're making decisions together like that have a little bit more of a consequence, like family vacation. Our kids, as an example, my wife and I give them a budget and they plan the vacation every year. And uh, then they invite us to go on the vacation when they when they've planned it, they, including tickets for us. So this year we're going to uh, Costa Rica. We're going in a couple of weeks, actually. And, um, and our kids planned it, and they invited us to go. You don't have to have a lot of money to do that. Just whatever vacation, well, maybe a little bit more than maybe the average Joe. But even if it's a camping trip, if the kids plan it and they bring the parents, they're learning decision-making. They're learning how to operate when mom and dad are gone. My kids would be able to manage what's left much better than, my, than I was when my parents died uh, or their parents died before them. So this can be done pretty small. Legacy is really the next step, which is how do we endow this process? What I have beyond this, the next slide, is just an example. This is a mission statement that one of the families that we work with created. They actually, this picture goes on the wall for everyone in their family meetings. I mentioned the Green family. They actually have a room in their uh, facility that's built uh, a, for their family, they call it the family legacy house, but it, it's all uh, propagated with a called history about the family. It's like a museum of their family. Um, families don't have to have a museum. You can just have posters you bring out and put on the wall for the family meeting to remind us of who we are. And this family created this one as an image of that. The next one is a similar vision of a family mission. And it's a, um, go to the next slide there. It's a set of railroad tracks going off into the distance. And the father said, I love this idea that the right hand rail of these railroad tracks is us working on the business. And some of you are helping us and we're, you know, we're actively working on the business and growing the wealth and whatever it is. But the left hand rail is why aren't we intentionally working on the family? Now, these two rails look like they come together on the horizon at the vanishing point, but they never do. They're actually always the same distance apart. But the, the thing that links these together is the governing structure, the family education process, the philanthropy, the entrepreneurship. Um, and that concept of entrepreneurship leads to the next slide, which is uh, I'm finding families are really interested in creating an entrepreneurial mindset in the family. Many entrepreneurs are really interested in it. They don't realize that they're usually raising their children to be non-entrepreneurial. And I say that because one entrepreneur had a wonderful way of putting it. Um, he said, you know why it is that um, we entrepreneurs are having a hard time raising entrepreneurs. And I said, no, you tell me. I mean, I'm, I, I learn from people like you. Please tell me. I'd love to know. And he, he had a great perspective. He said, because we entrepreneurs are the kind of people that learned how to shape our own world. 
we shaped our business the way we want it to be. We shaped our home to be the environment we wanted to live in. We shape our, our, our it's whole environment. I mean, we shaped our world. And he said, I feel like I've raised my children to live within the shape that I created. I didn't teach my children how to shape their own world. And I love the way he put that. So how is it then entrepreneurs create an environment that is not as likely to create future entrepreneurs? If you remember the Jim Grubman slide that I showed you a while ago, where low left hand uh, in the low left hand quadrant, families of lower net worth had tremendous interdependence. That's an entrepreneurial incubator down there in that lower left hand corner. Working class, middle class families, most wealthy families today, most of your wealthy clients, I bet, came from that working class, middle class background. And, uh, and the statistics show it's between 80 and 85 percent of wealthy families today came from that background. Yet they raised their children in a different environment than that lower left-hand quadrant. They lay, raised them in the middle of that kind of independent phase, which is far less likely to raise entrepreneurs. So, um, and one of them said, I mean, I feel like I raised my children to live within a shaped environment. Okay, well, how do you help them get back to entrepreneurial mindset? The next slide shows a little bit of this. Um, most colleges are not, that are teaching entrepreneurship are actually not teaching entrepreneurship. What they're teaching, if you look at most entrepreneur programs at colleges, they're really teaching the left-hand column on this slide, the process of entrepreneurship. And they say, identify a pro an opportunity, develop the concept, understand the resources required, acquire you know, the recourse, resource you need, implement it, manage it, blah, blah. This isn't entrepreneurship. This is small business management. Entrepreneurship is on the right-hand side. It's really this idea of, can we have a practice do I have a mentally a practice of play, a free and imaginative mind, and a practice of empathy? It's not a process, it's a practice, a practice of creation, solutions, um, a practice of experimentation, and a practice of reflection. The next slide shows you what this, well, actually, the next slide is a, a quote by Aristotle. Um, it's the whole notion of doing to learn. I love this quote. For things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. Every entrepreneur that I, that I work with knows exactly what that means, and yet their children don't. Um, it's like, wait a minute, no, I gotta learn first before I can do. Mm, that's not what your parents did. <laughs> and it was, a, it was really a kind of a combination. So the next slide shows what entrepreneurship ideally can look like. This is from uh, Brush, Neck, and Green. Uh, wrote a wonderful book called Teaching Entrepreneurship. But on the upper right-hand uh, corner of that circle is that practice of play creating that free and imaginative mind, leading to a practice of empathy. empathy. It, can, you, can you see problems? I mean, if you get to the airport and there's a long line of security, you just get in it and play solitaire, or do you see that that's a problem and try and come up with solutions? And um, do you, so do you, have an, uh, do you have empathy for what the problems are people are faced with? The next uh, level is, can you create solutions to that? And the next level is, can you practice experimentation to uh, solve that? And then the middle is the practice of reflection uh, to get it all to work together. Um, in a family, this concept of teaching entrepreneurship has to happen within the family culture soup. And that's again where I think people like us have an opportunity to introduce these ideas better than the parents can. So the next slide, actually, we can skip the next one, Marty. Um, it's just this notion of the family entrepreneurial mindset. But if you go to the next one, what a familyness and entrepreneurial mindset looks like is this next slide. The next slide, Marty. Yeah, it's a group family problem identif identification practice, a group family solution creation practice, a group family plan implementation practice, a group family experimentation practice, a group family education practice. Um, this is uh, This is what, one of the things we're introducing in the six step process um, at family meetings is what this would look like. And I gotta tell you, a lot of entrepreneurial parents are really interested in, yeah, I want an entrepreneurial family because uh, if they're just gonna rely on the enterprise that I built, that won't last multiple generations from a wealth standpoint. But if they have the creativity to continue to uh, create new, new uh, empire, enterprises, um, that can go a long way. Well, the last step is the next one, which is how do we endow the process and the next slide shows um, an article that that I was in Trust in Estates magazine um, a year and a half ago uh, that Gary Post and Marvin Blum and I uh, wrote on a trust 
uh, that we came up with an idea of, of a trust designed to endow the family meeting process. If it makes sense to have family meetings and, and we're doing them and everyone likes it, then why wouldn't we endow the process? And, uh, and the, I encourage you to take a look at the article. It gets into it. Because um, the underlying thought was, if we have really good family meetings that everybody loves them, then when mom and dad are gone, the family will keep doing them. And it wasn't happening. I don't care how well they liked them. It wasn't happening. Because you know we went from one couple paying for it to three couples paying for it, if there are three kids. One couple organizing it to three couples organizing it. And they were saying, hey, I love you, family, but you know what? I got other things to do this year. And they weren't, and they weren't coming. Um, or enough of them weren't coming that it was falling apart. And it was delay, 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 dead. But if it was endowed, it was highly likely to keep going. And so this article, and I'll let you read some of the additional slides. I won't go into them because um, we don't really have time. But I encourage you to Tom, take a look. Tom? Yes. Well, well I, I think it's okay. I'm going to offer for you. Why don't you just give everyone right now your email address? I know it's at the end. And if somebody wants a copy of the article, they can email you and you can send it to them. Yeah, that'd be fine. My email is tom at genleg, name of our company, genlegco, that's G-E-N-L-E-G-C-O dot com. So tom at genlegco dot com, and I'll send it to you. So Tom, Tom will send you that article, and if you email me, I'll send you the article uh, on collaboration and teams that we mentioned earlier. Back, back to you, Tom. Yeah, the next, I'll skip this then because it's in the material, but um, but the next slide shows a quote that I think is really relevant to this. Uh, actually, the next slide, sorry, we're just going to skip through these. Parents that I work with are more likely to endow a chair at a university to help educate strangers than they are to endow a chair at their family table to help educate their family. And I usually say that at a cocktail party, and inevitably I have people, you know, stare back at me like, what do you mean? Of course I, you know, I educate my family. I have a 529 plan. And I go, I'm great, but that's educating them somewhere else. I'm talking about your dining room table, about who you are, what your history is, what, the, what their values are. That has to happen at your table. Um, the next slides, again, I'm going to skip some of these, but they get into the, my own family. We have, six, we have four kids. We have six trusts. Four of them are, are, are individual trusts for each of our four kids to empower the individual, but two of them empower the group. One's sort of a foundation type concept, and the other one is, uh, is funding the family meeting process going forward, kind of like the trust I'm describing. So, and we don't have a ton of money, and yet we have six trusts, and, um, and it makes tremendous sense. Uh, for us to have. The next slide shows what the cost of this. Um, well, actually, this, this gets into, I made a comparison between the Forbes family and the Weston family. My own family have roots in the Weston family, Ezra Weston, that guy I mentioned before, known as King Caesar. And the Forbes family own the, uh, the Nosh, they own uh, the Elizabeth Islands in Massachusetts, extremely wealthy family um, by background. And, uh, and if you go forward a little bit, Marty, there's pictures of our ancestors that created the fortune. Here's some land that we each owned. Uh, the left is the Forbes, the right is the Rogersons or the, or the Weston family. Um, go to the next slide. And uh, what's interesting, the Forbes have on their family property on the second floor of one of their barns, they have what they call the family tree house. And if you go up the stairs, you can see in that picture in the middle on the bottom, right in front of you is the picture in the upper left of John Murray Forbes and Sarah Wayne, Swain Hathaway the original creators of the wealth. And uh, if you follow the lines around the wall, it leads to their children and then follow the lines from them, it leads to their children and their children and their children. This isn't a family tree house. It's a house for the family tree. The whole, I mean, I get goosebumps telling you this. Uh, when you uh, come to the family island, you, you, the first thing you do is you go to the tree house and you find your name and you see the connectedness. And the middle of the room is all these different placards of the history of the family. Um, you don't have to have a ton of money to have something that uh, just some placards that tell your history. You can keep going, Marty, to the next one. Um, this is the cost of it. How much are people paying for money management? If you had a $20 million client, you know, and again, this is a lot of money, but, you know, imagine it's less if you want. But if you had a $20 million client, um, they're paying 20, let's say they're paying 25 to 50 basis points on money management. That's costing them on the left-hand side five hundred to a to thousand to a million dollars over a ten-year period of time. In the middle area, the estate planning and tax minimization area, they're probably spending over a ten-year period of time two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars minimizing taxes on a yearly and and a, and a planning long-term basis. How much are they paying on family governance? Usually zero. 
unless at the bottom of the page there's a presenting problem. Then they'd pay anything. One of our clients, the wife walked into the, the garage and found her daughter trying to hang herself from the rafters. How much are they willing to pay for that? Anything. This is preventative, but we can do it. And it's part of what we can do as a practice. Marty, if you go forward, um, and it, this is a website, the famleg.com website is just a body of work. If you're interested in learning more about some of these things, there are webinars on there that you can uh, take a look at that actually describe the six step process, what the problem is, it slows it down. And so uh, um, if you're interested, you can uh, take a look. Um, the next slide just has a little quote that I have for this um, African proverb. If you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. The last slide I'll put up and we'll just leave it there is uh, this one, the conclusions. Most families fail. The statistics are just overwhelming and the statistics are not going down. Unfortunately, the, the estrangement of family members is increasing the phenomenon. The cause of this phenomenal wealth is not bad investing. It's, it's about these family issues that we can help families with. Most modern estate plan does not address this. Number four, cultural is, culture is hard to change, especially from the inside out. Number five, the key to changes of the paradigm of shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve is through meetings, family meetings, what we're talking about today. Number six, traditional estate planning tools alone cannot guide families across generations. Seven, families must have family meetings. I'm redundant there, but it's important. Um, eight, governance practice and followed and practiced. A fun to fact. Uh, number nine, shared experience activities are really important. Create belonging. And then number 10, hire an experienced facilitator and consultant to get the process started. Marty started with a question at the very beginning of how do we work on this and uh, ideally together. And um, what, I normally, what I normally do when I do a family meeting, even though the first family meeting is not going to be about the money, I strongly encourage all the advisors to be there because the advisors need to learn about the family and the family needs to learn about the advisors. And, uh, and they should be part of the ongoing meetings because each of them has educational content to bring to the table ongoing. But the focus of the family meeting in the beginning should be purely family and, and it should never lose more than 50% of the agenda being about family forever. Um, yes, there'll be other things that we'll all participate in, but the focus needs to be in the family if we're going to break the paradigm of shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations. Tom, so that's how do I present and really you, quickly? But yeah, thank you. How, how do I how do I present you to a client? So if I have a client that I think would benefit from this, and I have many, what what do I say to the client to get this topic on? I haven't broached this kind of formal fa family meeting, nor my role in it with with most of my clients. How, how would you suggest I, as an advisor, do that? And what do I say to them? Uh, in order to introduce you as a, a facilitator to help make it happen? Well, in some of the material on the on our website um, that does describe, in fact, there's a video on our website that is free if you want to take a look at it. I did it for Penn State, but it lists in the beginning of the presentation the statistics of why families are failing. If any of you email me, I'll send you, in fact, some slides that show the statistics of why families are failing, and they are failing, and the statistics of how many are failing. I usually start there. That um, you know, I, I would I would work with talk to people and just say I'm amazed how many really intelligent people I work with, unbelievably wealthy, unbelievably successful, uh, that don't think that they're heading towards these statistics, and yet they are. And uh, then I share the statistics, and uh, I often get them. You know, I, I get a lot of people wondering, okay, what do we do about it? And um, and then well I've got a guy that I recommend we do a phone call with that's all you have to do and uh, and then give him a, I'd love to do a call with you and your prospect um, and or your client and just uh, share some of the information if you participate in one or two of those calls you first time you're going to think wow that's a lot of good information second time you're going to think wait he said the same stuff you know last time third time you can think I I'm now I'm starting to get it I see what I can say at a cocktail party to get more people engaged in this. And if you make this part of your introductory conversation for clients, you're gonna grow your businesses faster because this is something that they're much more interested in at a cocktail party than they are about their estate plan. Um, Tom, thank you. It was an enlightening and informative webinar and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we have another program next week um, with, um,
Steve Gorn on uh, business tax planning. Uh, if you need more information on that, please email me. And again, if you email me, Shankman at Shankman Law, I will be happy to send the article that Tom and I co-wrote um, on uh, collaboration that will help you understand how on smaller clients you can practically integrate some of this planning. And Tom, uh, Tom's email is on the bottom of the slide on the screen, and he'll email the article that uh, uh, he did on the uh, Fast Trust if you'd like a copy of that as well. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marty. Bye.